Happy Tuesday, ladies. Welcome back to Ladies Bible Study. My name is Star, and I'm the pastor's wife here at New Hope Baptist, and this is our Ladies Bible Study, and we're studying the book Holy Women. And today we're on Lesson 13, Provoking Unto Love. And we're going to take a few minutes today and just talk about this, this subject of love. And we'll get into the, the meaning of charity, actually, which I'm really excited about. And so I hope you took the time to read through the lesson and answer the questions as best as you can. We're going to start right off the top with Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to begin with our scripture. And the first question says, name two positive actions a loving wife needs to display as found in Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. So let me read that for you real quick. That says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So submission both to our Lord and to our husbands, first to our Lord and then to our husbands. And I know you're probably thinking, well, here we go, <laughs> talking about this um, whole submission thing, but it really is key to a happy, peaceful home. And I really like backing up to what verse 21 says, though, because that says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so marriage isn't a 50-50 thing, like the old saying goes. It really is each giving 100%, which is what makes it work so well. And the first step is to make sure that we're fully submitted to our Heavenly Father, because only then can we even attempt to submit to our husbands or whatever other authority is in our life, whether it's your father or your mother or whatever authority that you have. Submitting to our Father in Heaven on a daily basis makes submission to any other authority so much easier because it's natural. It, it becomes a natural progression for you to, to submit. But if you fight and you struggle and you argue with the Lord about things, it's going to be the same way in any authority um, relationship that you have, but especially your marriage. So practice just submitting to the Lord and saying yes when He speaks to you. So, and I'm aware that some of you that join in with our Bible study, you're not married yet. Maybe you're a young adult. Maybe you just, I had a teenage girl the other day contact me and ask if I could start sending her the notes. One of our sweet little bus kids, Alyssa. Um, but maybe you want, were once married um, and your husband's passed and now you're a widow. Or maybe your marriage has sadly ended in divorce. But I know that not every lady that I'm talking to today is in the same um, position. And so I, I try to be very aware of that. And so I, but I know this matter of submission, it covers more than just the husband wife relationship. It covers any authority relationship. <laughs> There's mine. <laughs> I wish you would listen to your own lessons. <laughs> I try, I really do. <laughs> Preach to us, honey. <laughs> Get right with God, woman. Uh, uh. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, for listening to this. She works so hard on this, these lessons, and I appreciate her doing this. I appreciate you listening. God bless you all. Sorry to bother you. Sorry. <laughs> no bother. He even brought me a coffee from Dutch Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's really sweet, <clears throat> very kind. Wish you all could have one like mine, but I got the last good one, I think. But talking about submission, let's see where we... It covers more than just the husband-wife relationship. It covers any authority relationship in your life. Um, <clears throat> and I believe the greatest lesson here for us in this part of the lesson is our submission to the Lord. Because if we can get that one built solid into our lives, it'll work in any relationship. It'll help you um, where submission is needed, even in the workplace. So, And it'll take the fight out of you. When something is required that you can't fully understand, you know, sometimes um, maybe at work or maybe in a ministry that you're involved in or something like that, there's a requirement placed on you and you and it gives you pause, you know, but if you're fully submitted and there's no reason for you to not follow that requirement, it'll it'll help you not to argue and uh, have a bunch of pushback against things like that. So submission is so key. I heard an old time preacher one time say that submission is trusting your husband to do what is right, even when you don't like what you see. Um, and while I agree with most of that, I know there are times when you may discover that what your husband is doing is downright wrong, um, downright sinful. And that's when godly, patient, mature communication is needed between the two of you to sit down and talk and work through the issue. 
Um, and if he's a believer, this is where verse 21 comes into play, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Um, and if you're not a mouthy wife by nature, and I say that carefully, if you're not prone to like chiding him like a mother, um, then your chances of him listening to you are much greater when you come to him about something that you see in his life that's concerning to you. And so if it's not earth shattering, something um, like pornography or adultery, if it's not something like that, then spend time praying and fasting over your husband. Because so many times, if you just remain quiet and patient and supportive of him in whatever valley he's in, you don't know what's in his mind and heart. It might be something he's not shared with you. But if you'll just remain patient and quiet and supportive of him, many times in time, the Lord will bring him up out of it. I've seen that with my own two eyes. So <clears throat> submission. Number two says, explain, explain why these are important. I think we just covered that, the reason why submission is so important to our Lord and our husband. But another thing I might add is that if you have children in the family, they're watching and they're learning, especially if you have girls. Um, they're learning their ideas of submission from watching you as you submit to your um, Lord and to your husband. And if they see and hear you arguing, fussing, and fighting with your husband about things, about decisions that he's made, that's what they're going to learn. They're going to learn that that's okay. Um, not only will they attempt that with their daddy, but then down the road, that's going to carry over into their adult lives and just regenerate itself in their own marriages and in their own children. So if you have an unhappy marriage for whatever reason, please don't argue in front of the children. Please don't do that. That's not healthy. It's not a good thing to do. Um, if you're in a disagreement about something, just always discuss it in private. Just between the two of you, the kids don't need to hear that stuff. <clears throat> and um, never, never, never. I don't know how many times I could say the word never. Never talk to your children about things that you and your husband are struggling with in your marriage. Please don't ever do that. That is such an unhealthy uh, thing to do. <clears throat> I don't care if the whole world seems like it's falling down around you. Your children shouldn't be the ones that you unload on about their father. So get counseling if you need to, but don't ever talk to your children about your marriage issues. Um, <clears throat> number three says define reverence. And that is fear mingled with respect and esteem. And so we're instructed to reverence our husbands, right? Fear mingled with respect and esteem, not fear like a cringing fear, oh, not that kind of fear, but a, a, a reverential respect. The opposite of reverence would be nagging or belittling. So there's two sides of, of reverence there. And when quarrels are carried openly, that's a sign that the reverence has been lost. If you feel that it's okay to challenge and argue and push back, there's no reverence there. The man is the head of the home, no matter what. That wasn't my design. That was God's. He put it in his word. That's his plan for our marriage. Um, so if we have an issue with that, we need to take that to the Lord. Take it to him. Let him help you with it. Bec um, but don't be that woman that says, well, he is the head, but I'm the neck that turns the head. <laughs> that, that's a horrible, rotten attitude to take about authority in the home. It's It really is awful. And that and thinking like that will stop up the hand of God's blessing in your home and in your marriage. So please, please don't do that. Um, give your husband the, the respect that he deserves. And we're going to skip number five because that was kind of a personal answer. Number six says, list specific ways that we may love others as found in Romans 12, 9 through 12. And so those verses say, let love be without dissimulation. Not a word we use much, but we'll talk about it here in a minute. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. And so we were told to list some ways that we can love others according to these verses here in Romans chapter 12. And so if you just go through the list, <clears throat> the first one is to love without dissimulation. And we don't use that word. I had to look it up, dissimulation. It means hiding under a false appearance, feigning, false pretension, hypocrisy, assuming of a false or counterfeit appearance which conceals the real opinions or purpose. So basically being a phony. <clears throat> um, so loving someone without 
without dissimulation basically means to love them sincerely, not being phony about it. You don't act like you have an undying love for them when they're with you. And then the minute you have an opportunity, you talk about them for ill and you pounce on them and stab them in the back about things. And sadly, I've even, I've heard women even do this, um, with their own husbands. So without dissimulation, don't be phony about your love for others. Yeah, I can't, I can't stand pretense. Oh, goodness gracious. The second way we can love each other is being kindly affectioned. So that's having an affectionate feeling in our heart for others. Just affection. Today, a lot of love feels like it's so surface, doesn't it? Like, it doesn't feel affectionate to me. It doesn't, it doesn't really feel brotherly or fervent um, when it's coming from someone else. It, it as the Bible instructs us to love, it, it mostly feels kind of surface. Um, then another way to love is in brotherly love. And so when I think of that, I think of family type of love. Man, we'd go to the ends of the earth, earth to do things for our family members, wouldn't we? We'd move heaven and hell if we have to, to meet the needs of our family. But if we do that for our family members, why won't we do it for someone else? Why not do it for others? Why not love them that way? It's the Bible way. The fourth way is to prefer one another, preferring one another. That means placing someone else's needs ahead of your own, even if you have to change your plans to accommodate them. That's a tough one because we have our plans. We have our, you know, we have our schedules, our things we need to do, the things we want to do, you know, but to move our things out of the way to accommodate somebody sometimes can be irritating to us, can it? We're not always willing to go that far. So, but preferring one another means placing someone else's needs ahead of your own. And I think the best place to practice that is in the home with your husband. That's a, that's a wonderful kind of love to prove to your husband is that you'd prefer him over yourself. <clears throat> the fifth way is fervently. And this word means, and I think we have kind of a general idea what fervently means, but it means earnestly or eagerly, vehemently, with great warmth, just fervently. And just about after just about every church service, my husband um, stands in the front of the invitation and prompts our church family with that verse that says, love one another with a pure heart fervently. And he'll have them quote the verse with him. And it's not in a redundant way, but it's a great reminder for us how we're supposed to love each other fervently. <clears throat> Number six, um, the sixth way that I see that we can love one another is patiently. <laughs> Boy, if you have a problem with patience, <laughs> I pray for you. I I like to think I'm a pretty patient person, but there are things that get me riled up and make me impatient, you know. But patiently, to love someone patiently means that you're loving them with calmness or composure, no matter what's happening. Without discontent, without murmuring, you're just going to be patient and love them no matter what. Without agitation, without uneasiness, no matter what's happening in their life or yours. Nothing should upset that love, but remain patient no matter what's happening. The seventh way I see that we can love people according to this passage is prayerfully. What a tremendous way to prove our love for others, to take their names and their needs to the throne of God. So many times I hear someone say, thank you for praying for me. I can feel it working. Um, and just to know, just to know that someone is able to keep going, <clears throat> they're able to keep putting one foot in front of the other, even in great trials of affliction. That's a way that you can prove that you love somebody is by praying for them. <clears throat> Number seven says, list the characteristics of charity set forth in 1 Corinthians 13. And we're going we're gonna, to um, sit here for just a few minutes and dissect these verses a little bit. And then it says, mark those you find the most lacking in your life and <clears throat> purpose to make them matters of prayer. And so I hope you took the time to do that, to really go through there and look. And, and you've probably heard message after message on 1 Corinthians 13 over the years of being saved, but it's always good to go back and remind ourselves of things that we've learned and heard. Um, like the Bible says, lest at any time we let them slip because things happen in our life. Um, irritations, uh, busyness, just trials, all those kind of things tend to bump us a little bit and the things that we've heard and learned they start slipping. So it's always good to go back and remind ourselves and strengthen the things that are in our 
that are in our life, that are in our heart and mind. Remind ourselves. So <clears throat> let's look at these. So the, and there, and you may have pulled more out of it than I did. If so, I hope you'll uh, jump in and, in and add yours. But the first one I see is suffers long. And I like to, without doing any disrespect to the word of God, and, and I heard this from my husband and my father-in-law, other preachers, but when you read through 1 Corinthians 13, put your name where it says charity. And so when I read through there, the first one I see is suffers long. Charity suffers long. And so I ask myself, does star suffer long? Do I? Do I suffer long? Am I a long-suffering person? This means bearing injuries or provocation for a long time, being patient, not easily provoked. And so Exodus 34, 6 says, The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. And so if we're to follow his example, we need to be in long-suffering like him. He, his uh, measure of patience with us amazes me. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, you know, when I go to the altar for the same thing or um, battles that I have in my life or things that I know I should do that I don't do or things that I shouldn't do that I do do, you know, his just his long suffering and his patience with me amaze me. So I should be no different with people. My humanity makes me want to say, mm, and you're done, <laughs> you know, but we can't be that way. We, we must be. Uh, believers that suffer long. The next one we see is kind. Charity is kind. And that means disposed to do good to others. <laughs> Just simple kindness. Um, making people happy by granting their requests. Don't you just love to make somebody's day by doing something kind for them? I don't do that stuff enough. I really want to be able to do that stuff more. <clears throat> Supplying someone's wants or assisting them in their distress. Having tenderness or goodness of nature. Being benevolent giving and luke 6 35 says for he is kind unto the <laughs> this, this verse is very convicting luke 6 35 for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil um 36 says be therefore merciful as your father also is merciful so there's a good example for us to follow there just being kind the third one charity envieth not envy is uneasiness or mortification or discontentment at the sight of another's superiority or success accompanied with some degree of hatred or malignity and usually with a desire to depreciate the person with pleasure in seeing him depressed that's quite a description of envy there envy springs from pride so basically it's you being upset that someone else has obtained something that you've always wanted that's envy and what is it what is it and having food and raiment therewith we need we should be content i'm probably misquoting that but we need to be content with what god has provided for us not envious of what somebody else has so the next thing is charity vaunteth not itself to vaunt means to boast to make a vain display of one's own worth one's own attainments what one is what they have what they've done <laughs> We've all met people like that, haven't we? <laughs> They've been there and done that. Um, and they're hard to be around. They're hard to be around, and it's hard to get a word in edgewise with people like that. Someone who's done it and seen it all, you know. Don't be that kind of person. They're, that's That is not a lovely kind of person to be. Um, the next thing, charity is not puffed up. It's not bloated with self-conceit. Um, self-conceit like see see me see what i've done you know look at how great i did this thing or you know oh i gave this or look how i managed to organize this you know it's not puffed up with self-conceit the next thing charity does not behave itself unseemly unseemly is also not a word we use very much but unseemly means unbecoming or not proper or not graceful or suitable that's unseemly so <clears throat> Does star behave herself unseemly, not properly, not gracefully or suitable? The next thing is charity seeketh not her own, meaning you're not selfish. You're not seeking your own things. You're seeking the things of others to meet the needs of other people. Put others' needs ahead of your own always. And that when you practice that kind of life, God always, he always meets your needs. He does. I don't... I don't 
I don't ever remember a time when I've met someone else's needs that I thought, great, now I didn't get to do what I needed to do, you know. I, I don't think, I, I can't recall a time like that. God has always met my needs. The next thing is charity is not easily provoked. You're not easily angered. When something happens in your life that bumps you, that you don't like, something rubs you the wrong way, um, upsets your apple cart, changes your whole schedule for the day, do you get easily angered over stuff like that? Don't The Bible says charity is not easily provoked. The ninth thing is charity thinketh no evil. So <clears throat> you have to ask yourself, do I have a pure and right thought life in regards to others? Or do I constantly think ill of them? The next thing is rejoiceth not in iniquity. So you don't take any joy in hurting people. And I've met people that seem like they uh, are happy when someone gets hurt. Like they deserve it or they deserve everything they get because of how they are or what they did or whatever. They're so vengeful. Um, people like that are, I just that's just such a wicked attitude to have but rejoiceth not in iniquity which takes no joy in hurting people doesn't wish harm or ill to others no matter what no matter what they've done um, it could be us <clears throat> doesn't rejoice at the faults and failings of others but instead rejoices when men do well and truth prevails that's what we should rejoice in the next thing is beareth all things so <clears throat> you put up with all kinds of hurts <laughs> and you've, you've probably had hurt in your life, but sometimes our humanity makes us want to say, I'm done. I'm done being hurt. I don't want to be hurt anymore. I'm, I'm out. I'm done. I give up. But the Bible says, beareth all things. You put up with all kinds of hurts, things like cursing, slanders, prison, bonds, torments, when, when this was written, these people went through all kinds of things for the sake of others. Um, and, and they did it without getting angry or wanting revenge. This is how believers in Paul's day, in Christ's day, um, this is what they strove for, to be like this. It's why they could go to the stake and die a martyr's death without shouting out cursing at their tormentors, because they believed they could bear all things with Christ helping them. <clears throat> we... Um, today, give up way too easily. We don't bear all things like they did. We give up. Um, the next thing I see, and I'm going to include these kind of in a little group, <clears throat> believe with all things, hope with all things, endure with all things. Because they kind of like, they're like little stair steps when you look at it. It doesn't mean that you believe all sorts of silly things about people. Um, because the Bible says wisdom dwells with prudence. And so you, you have to look, be able to look at a situation and know that it's right you don't believe silliness but you do try to believe well of people and have a good opinion of them as best you can don't always look at them negatively <clears throat> everybody has some good in them you just have to really look hard sometimes to find it but keep a good opinion of them if you can unless they've given you a reason not to you know um, even as far as going the second mile and stretching your faith to its limits, maybe you need to go the third and fourth mile. Maybe you live with someone that you think, or, you, or you're dealing with someone that you think, oh, I've done the second mile, I've done the third and fourth mile, I've done a hundred, I've done a hundred thousand. <laughs> but just keep going. Just just keep believing, keep hanging on. Um, when you can no longer believe well of them, then you start hoping right? Then there's hope. As long as there's life, there's hope. And so charity isn't the kind of love that easily gives up on people. You always hope, maybe, 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 you know, you'll keep going and enduring in the worst of times, <clears throat> patiently waiting and hoping and praying for them. And it helps if you realize that that could be you, that that could be you on the other end, on the other side there. It could be you in that spot. And how long would you want someone to keep loving you? How long would you want someone to keep believing in you and hoping for you and enduring for you? And that's kind of that's the kind of thought we need to have about that if you were the one in sin. And you know, <clears throat> Christianity would probably be a whole lot more lovely to the world if if we who profess it actually practiced God honoring charity in our lives. And I'm not saying to poo-poo someone's sin and act like you're in agreement with it, that you're okay, everything's hunky-dory with what they're doing. I'm not saying that because 
um, sin is sin and God is angry with the wicked every day. So we need to, we do need to recognize sin for what it is, but hate the sin, but love the sinner. That's, that's what, that's our mentality that we're supposed to have. Um, but we need to keep a Christian head and heart about it when we encounter someone that's not doing right when we're dealing with people in the hopes of seeing them either turn to Christ or turn back to Christ, which whatever the case might be there, because our human love has limits, <clears throat> doesn't it? I, and I believe very few are actually distinguished with Bible charity like we see in 1 Corinthians 13. I, I saw things in the list that... Um, can be a struggle for me that I have to work on. Um, <clears throat> but Jesus commanded in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. And when he's saying love one another, he means charity kind of love, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's charity. Um, so a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. He wants us to love one another like he loved us, like he loves us. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So if you want to be a good witness and a testimony for the Lord, learn to love. Learn to have fervent charity. <clears throat> and then the next one says, choose two of those that you're lacking and talk about what hinders you. And because of the setting that we're in where it's a recorded Bible study, we, we're not able to do that. But if you want to email or post in the comments or on my latest whatsapp if you want to share on there we can talk about it there but number eight says how do you define love well i always go to webster's 1828 dictionary online for stuff like this and he says love in a general sense is to be pleased with to regard with affection we love a friend on account of some qualities which give us pleasure right Think of the ladies that you like to go out to coffee with or to lunch or to spend time talking with. We love them because it's it's a pleasurable thing being around them. We love a man who's done us a favor, right? We love our parents. We love our children on account of their connection with us and on account of many qualities which please us. We love to retire to a cool shade in summer. We love a warm room in the winter. We love to hear an eloquent advocate. The Christian loves his Bible. In short, we love whatever gives us pleasure and delight, whether it's animal or intellectual. And if our hearts are right, we love God above all things. So that's, I loved that description about love. And uh, it, it just, you know, it, it reminds me of how we, how we respond to people and why we love people. Number 10 says, if other members of your family treated you as you treated them today, would you believe they loved you? What kind of a person are you in the home? And I think we need to remember what's known as the golden rule. I mean, we, we say it, we quote it, you know, but I don't, I don't know that we always put it into practice necessarily. Matthew seven twelve. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So whatever you want from others is what you need to give to them. So if you're feeling not much love or kindness or patience from those around you. Stop a minute and do some introspection and ask yourself, how loving am I? How kind have I been today? How patient have I been today? How long suffering am I with my husband and my children, people around me, my friends, my coworkers, even if it never gets returned to you, even if your kindness and your patience and your long suffering, even if that doesn't get returned to you, it's still right to do um, the right thing on your part and the Lord sees and hears it all so it's always right to do right no matter what and it's a humbling thing to kill our inward selfish pride that desires to do back to um, that it desires that you get back what you're giving to people I'm being kind to you now you be kind to me I'm being patient with you now you be patient with that's how we want it to work isn't it but if it doesn't we still need to keep being kind and patient and loving with people. It's always right to do right, no matter what. <clears throat> Number 11 says, why does God consider love to be vital in the life of a believer? And there's two um, passages here, Colossians chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Um, Colossians says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, 
meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And then um, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says, Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So, so no matter what else there is in our life, if we lack charity, then we lack the greatest thing. 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says, Let all your things be done with charity. All your things be done with charity. So in, in another sense, we can say that charity is the summary of all the things that are described there in Colossians chapter 3 because charity perfectly fulfills what God requires of us in our relationships. You can try to do, you can try to add all those virtues to your life, but if you're trying to add them without, without charity, it's not going to, it's not going to work. If we truly pursue charity, <clears throat> we will truly pursue all the other things we're told to put on. But because charity will lead us to them, it'll, it'll help us to have the mind to want to do those things if we have charity in our life. But if we try to pursue them, like I said, without charity, everything's going to be distorted and imbalanced. It doesn't work that way. So inspired by the Holy Spirit, the, whole, the Apostle Paul was bold enough to call charity the bond of perfectness. It's what binds it all together. It's what binds us to Christ and binds us to each other, this matter of charity. Um, and the, the idea of a bond here is something like a chain or a rope that ties it, ties us up, ties all these things together. And so put, put on charity, let, let all that you do be done with charity. And in the best way, we need charity as a tie that binds, like I said, bonding us to God and to each other. And then number 12, and I think this is the last one says, explain how the knowledge that Jesus knows all our faults, <laughs> our failures, our sins, and yet loves us completely relates to your loving your husband and children. And so every time I deal with this thought, whether it's from my own heart or whether it's trying to help another lady down the right path, the, the first passage that always comes to mind is Ephesians chapter four. I love the reminders in that passage there. It's the perfect example of realizing what Christ has done for us and how we should behave like Christ when dealing with others. Um, if you think of the debtor, you know, um, and I didn't look up the passage, but it was a man that owed a debt and it was forgiven him. And then he turned right around and went to someone that owed him a debt and required payment. And so many times that's what we do, right? We've been forgiven of so much, but we refuse to forgive others. And that just can't be, that, that shouldn't happen in our lives. But um, Ephesians 4 reminds us of what Christ has done for us and how we should behave like him when dealing with other people, whether it's our spouse, our children, uh, friends, other family, co-workers, whatever. And this is a lengthier passage, but I hope that it will bear with me as I read through it and just remind ourselves of what steps we're to take when loving and living with our family. <clears throat> So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, we'll start there. That says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. 
and be a kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Wonderful passage and reminder for us. How can we sit back and enjoy the multitude of our Heavenly Father's tender mercies and then when our loved ones do something wrong, we attack them and refuse to forgive them? Can't That can't be. We can't be like that. Charity, always choose charity. Always love. And, th and that's a good place to end our lesson for today. I can't believe we made it all the way through one, one lesson in one recording. <laughs> but this was a little bit shorter lesson, but so needed in our lives, isn't it? Just this matter of charity with one another. I'm so glad you took the time to join with me today. Um, if, if we've never met before, I hope you'll take a minute to introduce yourself. And if you'd like the study notes, I'd be happy to send those to you. My email's down in the description box. You can jot me a note and I'll send you the notes for the lesson for next week. So, and if you know someone that you think could benefit from the Bible study, feel free to share the link. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. I'm headed out to a bridal shower here shortly. <laughs> so I'm going to go put on a pot of soup and uh, wrap my gift and get up there for that. But I hope you all have a wonderful day. And a wonderful rest of your week. Look for someone to be a blessing to. Look for someone to be kind to and good to. And just to lavish some charity on today. And most of all, look for someone to give the gospel to. <laughs> That's why we're here and our time is short. I love you all. Thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next Tuesday.